he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. What is Cardano's why and what are some of the most difficult how problems? Well, you know, I wrote why Cardano. <laughs> it's, it's its own website. Um, so if I had to summarize why Cardano, really what I wanted to do was build a financial operating system for those who don't have one. So what, what does that mean? Well, you know, have when you, you're a human being in a modern economy, you, know, you, you have people you need to do business with, you have value you need to protect, you have relationships that you need to extend across space and time, sometimes months, sometimes years. And if you're able to navigate, negotiate all these things, suddenly you have a car and a house and a business and productive output. And when bad things happen, like somebody runs into your car or your home burns down in the wildfires of California, or you need some money to grow your business because it's a recession, it just materializes. And it materializes not from friends and family. It materializes from people you don't know. You probably never met faceless people. That's the miracle of the modern economy, and it's why we've gone from a world where most people die before the age of 40, 45, and if you have kids, half of them die before they even reach adulthood, uh, to a world where most people now live in pretty good situations. So the problem with the financial systems that we have is those systems were constructed on 20th century notions. They weren't designed accounting for the internet. They weren't designed accounting for globalization. They weren't designed to be inclusive. They were designed to be the spoils of war of the victors of World War II and their extensions and those who supported us in overcoming the communists. So now we live in the 21st century where the rules of the game have changed. Technology has changed. Society has changed. We have, everybody's walking around with supercomputers in their pocket. Yeah, we're living in this very analog, old, digital, paper, excuse me, paper-based uh, financial world, and we're moving to a digital world. So the why of Cardano succinctly is to try to offer a parallel stack that is very different but interoperable with the legacy stack of the 21st century and propagate that stack throughout the developing world as a way that people can build something instead of top-down from the bottom up. And it's a huge social experiment in a certain respect. Society and human beings aren't so good at making decisions in a decentralized way. There is an overwhelming temptation to create a leader, a king, uh, or committee, or a federation, a congress, or a senate, and say, these people are in charge. They represent us. Go figure it out. And the problem is those people never actually fully represent you, and they get too powerful. And the very first thing they do is they try to create situations where it's really hard to get rid of them. If you look at the United States Congress, for example, uh, it's as about as popular as genital herpes, yet 90% of these guys keep their jobs every two years. I can't imagine anything where, you know, person would probably rather get kicked in the face than have you stay at work, yet still somehow you keep your job. You consistently, one election cycle after another election cycle and so forth because of the gerrymandering and the way uh, you know these things work. Okay, well, what if we had a system where somehow, some way, you don't have a congressman or a senator or a king or a president, yet somehow, some way, uh, that system is capable of figuring out where to go, what to pay for, how to make your life better. Now, we've done this in certain complex adaptive systems like markets. Markets are somehow able to price fish. They're somehow able to price computers and cell phones and that's the aggregation of millions of collective decisions concurrently uh, without a, you know, a central authority deciding that. And whenever a central authority tries to decide that, like with a communist government, usually they do a horrible job. The whole thing falls apart. You can't even try to steer it from the top. It has to be bottom up. So the, the other why of Cardano is to say, not only can we build a financial operating system and give this to the developing world, but then we can use the emergence of this parallel economy as a great social experiment to see what happens when no one's in control and to see if you end up getting a better outcome than when someone's in control. Because if you can have a situation where no one's controlled, but you end up having a better outcome and you can uh, uh, still price in externalities like environmentalism and you know, these other things, then you end up getting a world where you can't have a Xi Jinping and social credit, or you can't have a Donald Trump and all these problems. You end up getting a much, much better world uh, which doesn't have these these egos and strong men and big personalities that divide us and turn us against each other for personal power and enrichment. 
Now, in terms of the how, you know, that, that's, that's actually a lot easier because it's just a matter of knowing first how to build good software and design good protocols. And in everything you do, you always have to think to yourself, how do you avoid a cult of personality? So, for example, with the research we do, you look at it, contrast that with EOS or Ethereum. That's all about with EOS, the brilliance of Dan Larimer or Vitalik with Ethereum. And Vitalik will lead us to the mountaintop and figure out how these things are going to be done. So Vitalik will discover Casper. He will discover Plasma. You know, he'll figure this out, right? Even if he's God and a genius, that's not a decentralized ecosystem. If you rely on the lone samurai up on the hilltop to defend the village, the samurai, if he dies, your village is done. Now, what we do with our research is a contrast is we go to the universities, we go through a very faceless process, uh, the peer review process that we go through, you don't actually have names on the papers. And the peer reviewers, you don't know who they are. They come from a pool of people that are associated with a conference. I can't think of anything more decentralized than that because you can literally replace every single scientist and every single peer reviewer uh, and still end up having a perfectly functional system that continues to produce good science. The other thing is that we have universities all across the world. At Tokyo, at Tokyo Tech, at University of Athens, at ETH Zurich, uh, Kent University, Lancaster, Oxford University, uh, people at University of Edinburgh, people at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, uh, you know, at Rensselaer Polytech Institute, uh, Virginia Commonwealth Institute, I think there's more than a dozen of them. So you have tons of different institutions with different philosophies and different viewpoints and different goals and different agendas, yet somehow they're able to coordinate in some cases in, in a very loose autonomous way to do good science. And that science never has my name on it. It's one of the rules. Even if I wrote a paper, I won't put my name on it. Because I don't want people to say, oh, well, Charles Hoskinson is going to figure this out. I want a situation where I can get hit by a bus and it's still going to get done. So I think that's the most important component of the how for whatever we're doing is that we must be vigilant to decentralize the execution of all the things we do, whether that be the software development or the science or the community management or the use of funds all of these things have to come from a multi-model, multi-actor setup. And if you can do those things, then I think you can execute quite well. And whatever you end up building is built with checks and balances. We had an issue with Michael Parsons. There was two other independent entities to put considerable pressure on him, the guardians of Cardano, to put considerable pressure on him to the point where he felt compelled to resign. Contrast it with Tezos, where the only way to get him to resign was to pay him off. And, uh, and, you know, that's, that is, and he knew that. So you just sit and say, eh, I can't be affected by these class actions and all I'm going to do is make their lives miserable. So let's just wait it out and then see what kind of a deal we can get. Michael didn't get a payoff. He left. Uh, so, so that's the great part about these systems when you get them right. It's even when you make mistakes or the wrong people are in the wrong roles, you have an immune system for these things, and they tend to filter their way out over time, and conduct tends to normalize towards the standards. So that's, I suppose, the why and the how in, in, a, in a nutshell. But it's a, it's a fun thing to think about, and you know, maybe we get it wrong, but that's okay. You know, so if somebody gets it right, then you know, we all win.